Welcome to The Big Picture. This is the show that brings you news, views, and controversial commentary on the issues of the day. I'm Gerard McClendon, your host, and I'm joined by, in the on-deck circle, Teddy McClendon from McClendonReport.com, and in the batter's box, Matt Reardon from SEH. Matt, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Oh, man, I really, I really appreciate you coming out today. You know, uh, this is going to be a wonderful show on economic development. But first, I just want to get some of the logistics out of the way. You're an Andran High School graduate. Yes. You, you also went to Loris College uh, in Iowa, correct? Buick, Iowa. What, is, what was your uh, major there? Political science. Poli sci. And then, of course, you went to the University of Illinois having a master's uh, on cer certificate in, in public administration. Wonderful. Okay. Now that we got that out of the way, got the education out of the way, I want to move on to the EDFP. Could you explain that to us? Yeah, sure. That's Economic Development Finance Professional Certification through the National Development Council. Okay. And I also understand that you're a certified CDBG grants uh, administrator in the state of Indiana. Yes. Okay. The 2003 Distinguished Leadership Award, you the man, and also a licensed real estate professional in the state of Indiana as well. Let's talk about, let's start out by by defining what is economic development? Well, I think first of all, to me economic development really means one of three things, and that is the rewards that a community gets for, for new development. And that to, uh, to me means prestige, new tax revenue, and jobs. And those are the traditional benefits that I see in economic development. Okay. And it would depend greatly on which community you go to and what their target is. But essentially, in my mind, those are the three benefits or the three trade-offs that communities are looking for in that process. And you know what's sad though, Matt, is it seems as if those three things you just mentioned, it seems as if some communities just don't get it. You know, uh, it, 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 it really shocks me to see, you know, you'll drive to a community and you'll see this beautiful piece of land that's, that's vacant, you know, or you'll see another plot of land that has an abandoned building on it. And it's like, what are the people doing with this particular, you know, property? What are some of the downfalls of, of, of faulty economic development departments within cities? Well, I think the first and foremost that uh, the, the key to good economic development from, from a municipal perspective is understanding what you have available to offer uh, those people willing to invest in your community. And that means the following. Do you have land? Do you have rail? Do you have access to rail? Do you have adequate roads? Um, are you willing to give incentives? How, how much incentives are you willing to give? Do you have enterprise zones? Do you have empowerment zones? Having that information compiled. Having that information available when an inquiry comes across your desk uh, will make that site selector's uh, decision a lot easier because uh, the less homework they have to do, uh, the better your community is going to come uh, in their eyes. And if you don't have that information available, we're looking at disaster, aren't we? Well, essentially, if it's not available, that means the site selector has to do that homework. And it's, it's always nice to be able to respond promptly, efficiently, and immediately to say, I have this information available. Let me send it to you. Okay. And uh, that's, that starts the process. You know, oddly enough, Matt, with the, the factors that you just mentioned to um, uh, the potential for economic growth, Gary seems to fit right in well with those, uh, those factors and those qualifications. What do you think about that? I, I, I agree with you. Uh, Gary has available uh, every, uh, every state incentive on, on the table, mm -hmm. accessible. That includes uh, uh, Enterprise Zone empowerment zone and uh, they also on a federal level they do have uh, a significant amount of block grant dollars there in entitlement community mm -hmm. um, you know Gary they have another factor in play they do have a gaming boat which which funds dollars directly back into the community to be used for various issues so mm -hmm. Gary's very well positioned to do a lot of different things and uh, I think they're on their way to do those things, but again, uh, you have to be able to pre prepare yourself to give this information up to understand and focus on particular areas of concern. So whether that be, let's say, the airport, for example. I think Gary's taken some steps to address that, but you know, there's some environmental concerns about the airport and the land surrounding it that, that have been discussed. Uh, where would the funding come from to pay for a major carrier and the improvements necessary to do that? And uh, you know, is the city itself ready to allocate those resources to do so? And you know, those are questions for the mayor and, and, and the city council. There. So it's a matter of of getting in line with a, with the process, and it's a matter of of being bold enough or or forthright enough to say this is what we have to offer and and this is how we're going to exploit uh, mm -hmm. this offering. I I think that's that that sums it up pretty well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about some more definitions. People see this in the newspapers they read, terms like TIF, abatement, remediation, brownfield, and sprawl. Let's start with sprawl. What does urban sprawl mean, Matt? Well, I th urban sprawl means that development goes beyond the traditional urban boundaries where communities, whether, the, whether that be a county or a city or, or a township, will make an investment in infrastructure, sewer and water, in order to facilitate development further out in, in a greenfield site, in a cornfield site, and uh, expand that growth. Um, there's terms out there called smart growth, which try to prevent and talk through issues about why you should reinvest back into areas that you have infrastructure, you have sewer and water, that, that are in place. There are urban centers, our three, our three major cities here in northwest Indiana. Okay, okay. And what is a brownfield? And let's talk about remediation as well in a nutshell. A brownfield is a site that is, uh, uh, has been identified as a, uh, a problem with the environmental conditions of the property, real or perceived. And until you are able to go out and do your due diligence and test that, you won't know the answer to that. For example, a developer comes in, I would I'm interested, Gerard, in that 50 acres, mm -hmm. and uh, you don't know the environmental answer to that. Well, it's easy for that person then to go down the road further to a, a, a cornfield site where they have a reasonable mm -hmm. understanding of what activities took place there, make the investment there, and go forward as opposed to an urban site where you don't know the answer. So when I was saying that you need to be prepared, those are the answers that you need to have available. We have the environmental phase one. Here it is. Take a look at it hmm. so you understand what you need to do to make that investment. And what is remediation as we blend right into this? Well, you know, any developer would hope that they didn't have to do that. Hmm. Um, but that's the tail end of that process. Once you've done your due diligence and you find out what was on the site, depending upon what type of development you're ultimately going to do. And there's varying levels of, of, of cleanup necessary necessary, and that's what remediation means. Okay. Wetland mitigation, what is that? Uh, certain circumstances will require uh, wetlands that have been designated uh, on, on the map. Uh, those need to be addressed in a specific way, and you can't just fill in specific amounts of wetlands if you want to develop property. There's a reason why, and they help to maintain the, water, uh, the watershed and other ecological issues that are necessary in, in, our, in, our, in our cities. Okay, Matt, it's getting hot in here. We're going to put on our gloves and go for this now, and before the second segment. TIFs and abatements, these are incentives, okay, for the most part. An abatement is an incentive. Uh -huh. Is Do you think it is, for, for cities that are having problems getting new, big, sound businesses to come to a neighborhood or to a city, do you think that they should automatically give up the abatement? No. Okay. And this is why. I don't think any political jurisdiction should automatically do anything. There's a reason why you have uh, a city council or a town board. There's a reason why you have a plan commission. Mm -hmm. And what needs to happen is that the, the resources need to be put on the table, number one. The investment needs to be analyzed. The job creation needs to be analyzed. The construction jobs need to be analyzed. And you have to look at your community from a, a holistic planning standpoint. What does your master plan say we want to do? And then go forward. Okay. Now, let me, let me add to that. Okay. You start adding things like tax rates, higher tax rates, higher land costs, infrastructure needs, remediation costs, and suddenly a uh, deal in the northern part of the counties doesn't look as good as a deal in the, in, in the southern part of the counties because they have a lower tax rate, they don't have these environmental issues, they don't have the congestion issues, and so on. So I guess at the end of the day, you need to, you need to evaluate your opportunities to the fullest. And not summarily grant or deny anything. Okay, okay, okay. So it's not a gimme. No gimmies. No, no there's in fact statutory requirements that, that have to be met, and it's a but-for test. But for the use of this incentive, this investment wouldn't occur. And that's the premise that the tax abatement legislation is written on, as well as tax increment finance. Okay, okay. Northwest Indiana uh, has been going through some turmoil economically speaking over the last 30 years you know a lot of stuff's been going on of course steel mill layoffs have you know caused you know torrential damage but how does northwest indiana get to the point where it can kind of grab the bull by the horns and say look we still have some economic development opportunities here what does northwest indiana have to do from a matt reardon standpoint what does this 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 the the, the, the tri-county area have to do to get back on the block well i guess first and foremost the there needs to be a reduction in uh, tax rates and when i say that 
It, it sounds pretty simple. That's pretty lower, controversial. Lower, right? lower the tax rates. Well, uh, this is why. Until you have a system where we all talk about high tide you know, rises all boats. Well, in the economic development world, there's 48 different taxing districts in Lake County alone. Mm -hmm. And I don't know of those 48 how many have economic development professionals in there, but it's that job of that economic development professional to get that deal in my town. And mm -hmm. this is why, because the local property taxes are what drive our, our, our basically our municipalities. Mm -hmm. And the more businesses you get to come in, the, more, the higher your assessed valuation goes, the lower your tax rate can be, all things being equal. So you have a naturally competitive situation in our own state. Yeah. And now you start talking about the rest of the country and the rest of the Midwest yeah. and the successes that uh, other states have had. Um, I believe the state of Illinois was this year's area development number one development state uh, for new, new projects. Mm -hmm. Last year was Michigan. I think the year before that was Illinois and they seem to be ping-ponging it back and forth and we're right in the middle. Mm. And uh, you know you have external uh, uh, external troubles and they have internal uh, turmoil for projects and you know you start adding all these things up who has the infrastructure who's willing to do the incentives yeah. who has the land is the land clean and it's a it creates a competitive situation 48 different taxing districts w uh, explain why that's detrimental in comparison with another state or another uh, uh, municipality that may be outside of the state of Indiana? Well, I, I think because Indiana's, uh, Indiana, is, our local tax dollars are driven by our local our millage rate, which is going to have a pretty sizable, can have a very sizable effect on what you pay. Mm -hmm. On the northern part of, the, of, uh, of, of Lake County, we have tax rates that are $11. And you go to the other end of Lake County, you have rates that are $2. Well. You know, reason would suggest why would you pay 11 when you could pay two, all things being equal. You're talking about essentially the same labor pool. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about, depending upon your supply chain issues, your, your, your goods need to go to uh, various places throughout the Midwest and the country. Well, you're still pretty close to the interstates. So, you know, it comes down to a cost factor. You know what, Matt? He, you know what, Theo? He just kind of summed up why everything is going south. You know, literally, in terms of South County, in terms Indeed. of dollars, in terms of economic development, in terms of growth, and in terms of even safety. I mean, when you, if you look at the 11-2 rule of Matt Reardon here, it makes sense. I mean, why would you pay X amount of dollars if you can pay an X that's less. It becomes a no-brainer indeed. Mm -hmm. But you know, I want to introduce something else to the conversa conversation here. Um, uh, I want you to put on your thinking cap and, and, and give us all the creativity that you can muster, okay? Um, there was a documentary on a few weeks ago on PBS about the lakefront of Chicago and how it was originated and what the, the big picture was regarding that lakefront uh, as far as the aesthetic beauty of a, of a given city and a landscape. Um, our region is almost devoid of that. Sure, we have little sanctuaries that are the dunes and, and the Miller area, but, but relatively speaking, it's, it's, it's really not a lakefront per se. There's not a road out there. There's no sightseeing per se. Since the deal is already done, how over the next maybe 10 to 20 years can we maybe actually begin to have a beautiful lakefront or to actually have it as a tourist attraction, much like Chicago? We may have to save this question for the next segment. Um, uh, so I want you to re-ask the question. I, got, I do have some thoughts on I that. want you to re-ask the question while Mr. Reardon thinks about this, because this is, this is crucial. This is crucial. We want to thank you all for joining The Big Picture. We're with Matt Reardon from SEH, and we hope that you would stay with us after the break. You're watching the Comcast Network. Turn to us first. Now, on pay-per-view. You'll be working with a civilian. A civilian? Introducing the undisputed champion of the world. Kevin Robinson. Are you going to refer to yourself in a third person the whole time? Because that could get a little irritating. Now put this in my eyes. You know, I got the camera in my eye. Hey! Hey, I see me! Hey, I'm seeing what you see. I see me looking at you looking at me. I like this. I Spy. Rated PG-13. Watch it on pay-per-view. All over America, people are taking the national radon test. Have you? Oh, you put me on the spot! True or false, radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer. True. I'd say false. No, it's true. 
That's something new to me. The Office of the Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested for radon. False. It's true. True. So it's bad. We should get our house tested. Sure, I'm gonna call it. 1-800-SOS-RADON. How can you not call? 1-800-SOS-RADON. <laughs> Welcome back to The Big Picture. I'm joined by Matt Reardon from SCH and Teddy McClendon from McClendonReport.com. Theo the Thinker, Teddy, was asking a question about the lakefront here in northwest Indiana to Matt Reardon. Continue. Right. What I was saying before the break essentially is uh, I'm, I'm more of an artistic, aesthetic type person and, and I enjoy the, the physical beauty of landscapes and so do many other people. Uh, it's just something that makes your life, your quality of life, uh, a, a better quality of life. You look at Chicago and see how it's a well-designed lakefront, uh, and, and even Mayor Daley's so brash now, he'll destroy Mick's field and make it even more beautiful. You know what I'm saying? He's trying to make a park or whatever it is he's trying to do. But at the inception, when they were thinking of Chicago, they thought of beauty of the landscape. Uh, that's something that's sorely missing on our lakefront, and we have a, the, we're, it's the same lake. What do you think over the next several years can, can, can change the, the, the look of the lakefront? You know, since steel is somewhat on the decline, how can we maybe balance that with a, with a more beautiful lakefront? Well, I guess the, the, the first thing to note is why Chicago looks the way it does. And one is because Daniel Burnham designed it that way. Mm -hmm. And it was important to have public access to, to that lakefront. And in the early designs of Chicago, that's what they did. And if you look where the manufacturing was, it was away from the lake. And uh, there's another uh, factor, I think, that attributes to why Chicago looks the way it does, was the Chicago fire and what happened. Mm -hmm. it burned down a lot of the industry. Right. And they were able to pretty much pile it up to where you see the lakeshore, you know, develop right now and still maintain uh, the public access areas and, and go forward. Now you flip it over to northwest Indiana. And you have essentially entrepreneurs from the Chicagoland area and other places saying, I can go around the Horn, which is not very much for, farther away from Chicago, and I can develop these industries. And you look at the same, the same lake, as you said, but you had an area in Chicago, they said, you cannot build here. Right. And so you talk about the industries we have, steel and petroleum, et cetera, they required a great deal of water, they still do. Right. And hence their location at uh, you know, a, a fairly inexpensive water source. Right. And again, you look at physical location of where these steel mills are, right at the crossroads of, of, of the country. So we have had significant investment in these areas, and, and that's benefited Northwest India. Indeed. I mean, it, if you look and you could say, gee, it'd be great if, if U.S. Steel wasn't there. Well, that would be great, but that's what built this, this county. And right. same thing with Inland and BP, et cetera. Um, that's that's where, where people went to work. That's, that's what funded people's education. That's what bought houses. That's what drove the economy. So. Now, there was indeed a trade-off. If you look at BP, uh, you know, Whiting is, is why BP, and, and, and vice versa. Right. Uh, you look at, uh, you know, Gary and U.S. Steel. Well, that's, that's why Gary's Gary. Right. And so, you know, these company towns that grew out of this thing, and, and they needed access to, to the waterfront. So I think what we tried to do is maximize that. You see the dune area. Mm -hmm. And you have the, the marinas in, in uh, Whiting, you have a marina in Hammond, uh, you have the Pastrick Marine, and so on. I, th I think that that communities have tried to reclaim as much as they've, they, they could, but a lot of this is going to get back to what the, happens with the steel industry in the future. Right. Uh, you know, are these goods going to be produced somewhere else, and if so, what will the private sector and the public sector do to facilitate effective reuse of these properties? And that we're talking about large dollars of you know acres and acres and acres of lakefront property that for a hundred years has been used for manufacturing and seventy of those years there were scant amounts of environmental regulations going on. Right. There's to be some issues to address that. So it's a long-term process. It, as, I, as I like to say, it took 100 years to get this way. It might take 100 years to return, but I think now that you see the, the, all the jurisdictions around the lakefront and the county are taking notice of the value of that lakefront, and I think we're moving in that direction. It's just going to take a lot of resources. Right, indeed. You know what, Matt? One of the problems, and I'm glad you asked that question, uh, Teddy, one of the problems, and it goes back to this 48 taxing district thing, you know, it's like when Chicago has an initiative, 
it's just one city, Chicago. And then they can just kind of steamroll it, get it through the aldermen, get it through council, and it's pretty much a done deal. But in Northwest Indiana, everyone's fighting over the same businesses. I mean, we saw this with Krispy Kreme and Starbucks and the Railcats. It's like, well, who's going to get them? Who's going to get them? As opposed to this solidarity, a common front that says, we're one, we'll get it. You know, is that a problem? You know, you know, why is that such an issue in Northwest Indiana? I don't think it's just Northwest Indiana, to be honest with you. Okay. I think it's it's the way that economic development works in general. There's a, there's a competitive nature about this. People are trying for the prestige, the jobs, and the tax dollars. You know, gee, we want a Krispy Kreme, or we want you know, we want uh, the coffee shop. Okay. You know, some communities are willing to do more than others. The other issue is, is land costs. Sometimes it's cheaper than others. But I, and I believe the fundamental problem is, is that you have uh, an issue where in, you could be on uh, one street and pay X amount of dollars and be across the street and pay a different amount. And I think that, you know, to the extent we're talking about commercial business now, that the state of Indiana empowered the local jurisdictions to use some of the sales tax generated mm -hmm. uh, to facilitate these developments and to augment and offset some of the differences in our property taxes. To have a uniform net effective tax rate in County of Lake or LaPorte County or Porter County. So you're not talking about Unigov? No. Is that a dirty word? I, not in my book. I mean, it seems to work pretty well in, in, in our state. And I think you will find uh, people who are for it, people are against it. But I think what they've done on there is they've effectively shared costs where they needed to. And I think that you know the the government entities that they have in place, the county uh, the county council they have down there, and that, that basically manages and runs, and you have a you know the mayor of Indianapolis. I think that's worked. Yeah. I think we're a heck of a long way from that in, in Northwest Indiana. I don't think I'm the first why, person why, to say why that. Why are we a heck of a long way from solidarity or Unigov? Well, I, I, first and foremost, it's the responsibility of these mayors to to maintain their own communities, and that's that's what they're elected to do. And until there's an opportunity for open and honest discussion about sharing of cost and, and, the, and all these jobs we have created uh, throughout and, and, and that are duplicated in different communities, um, it's going to be a problem. Right. And again, you talk about cost and taxes. Well, it's, the taxes have to come from somewhere and they go to pay the cost to operate your community. If you can reduce your cost, that it doesn't become so necessary to worry about can I get the Krispy Kreme okay. or can I get this big development in St. John or can I get the theaters over here in, in Valparaiso or any of those things. I think we're calling for a more creative approach then. Because creative because not just Unigov, excuse me for interrupting, what you're speaking of is like Unitax where you can, you can, you can subjugate some of your uh, individual interests uh, for the good of the whole. And, and that will take a, a more creative uh, mm -hmm. and more cooperative mm -hmm. spirit. Okay. Such as a TIF. What's a TIF? A uh, TIF, tax increment financing. And what communities do is focus tax dollars back to a specific project. Okay. And that's, that's all it means. Uh, the taxes don't get distributed to all the taxing districts. It goes for a special purpose. Now, the reason why some communities have to do a TIF is because their tax rate seems to be higher. There's additional development needs. Which again, anybody can do them if they choose to and they can meet the findings, mm -hmm. just like a tax abatement. Some communities do, some communities don't. Uh, but to, just to kind of, again, top off what, what we were originally talking about, uh, I think that if we do have an effect, a unified effective tax rate, and we're talking about all coming together and all working together, I think that's the first step. Because until we can, in my opinion, we can eliminate the differences in the tax rate. So if I'm going to go to Valparaiso, I know I'm paying X dollars per square foot. Mm -hmm and it's going to be the same as it is in Gary, well then suddenly it's not a big issue where it ends up. And then that, that either diminishes the use of incentives or allows certain communities to use more incentives and to, and to, to all work together if in fact that's, that's where we need to go. Yeah, yeah. It's, this, this is interesting because I, the, notice the I-STEP scores. And of course the I-STEP scores south of Ridge Road are much better than the I-STEP scores north of Ridge Road. Uh, but what's interesting, it goes back to property taxes. The property taxes in terms of how much money can be galvanized for schools is mm -hmm. higher south of Ridge Road, lower mm -hmm. north Ridge Road. You know, and what I'm noticing is that, you know, there's 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 there seems to be so many dividing lines throughout the three county area, you know, and, and that's that really frustrates me because it, it's like there's there's no unification and I'm trying to figure out 
can is is economic development one of the approaches that we can use to one be on the same page to keep some of our graduates of college from leaving the region I mean people go to IU or Purdue and they graduate and they're like I'm not sticking around Northwest Indiana there's nothing there so is so is that is that the Northwest Indiana is that the school systems problem is that Echo Dev's problem is that the mayor and town managers problems whose problem is it Matt I think it's everybody's problem and uh, about while we're all three back here um, I think that you know you hear the brain drain and all these things it comes down to where can you get a job mm -hmm. and, and if you can get a job you're likely to stay and if you can't get a job you're going to explore your opportunities where they need to go right. and you know there, there there have been significant efforts to unify uh, the three county area and I believe it's actually a seven county area to, to begin economic de development discussions mm -hmm. and this is a, indeed a very good first step mm -hmm. and it's going to be a slow and painful process and in that process the, the participants which of which I am they recognize that there's a lot of borders there's a lot of, uh, of fences that we have to mend or take down mm -hmm. in order for this to work I mean just for an example you talk about the differences between the cities uh, you have a, a separate sanitary district a separate water district a separate civil city a separate school city uh, you have a separate library you have a separate park system and everybody in each one of those things is still trying to achieve the same thing, make sure that, you know, the sanitary is disposed of, people get fresh water, the parks are maintained, the schools are good, uh, I'm able to take care of governmental services, and everybody's doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah, and it be, but it becomes fractured. Something, I want to kick it back to you because this guy right here, my brother, he hates politics, man. <laughs> he doesn't believe in left, right. He, he thinks that, that thought and politics should be more cir circular, more cyclical, and Matt and Theo, what does does politics convolute economic development at times? A uh, Matt Reardon or a Teddy McClendon can have a brilliant idea on how to bring businesses in, but does does do politics and politicians just shut things down at times? Uh, I guess to uh, I've seen instances where politics and politicians have helped that effort and understood the benefits and the other side of the equation when. The mob has spoken, and uh, that was that. Yeah. And that's, again, uh, your first question asked me, should you do this automatically? It should never be automatically yes or automatically no. Okay. And, and they really need to look at the long-term benefits of what they're doing. Yeah. And sometimes that happens, sometimes that doesn't. Sometimes communities are better at it than others. Uh, and you'll find that Lake Porter, LaPorte County, and the rest of the state. Yeah, yeah. You know, something my brother mentioned, too, and you, if you want to elaborate on, on how people, some people in Gary are, like, protesting going to Railcats games. Could you just gloss over this quickly and, and why people should, hey, go out to the ball game? Oh, definitely go out to the ball game. Uh, if you disagree with it at the outset, uh, that's no reason not to take your family out for some uh, very inexpensive entertainment, which benefits everyone. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you've ever been to Wrigley Field, or White Sox Park, you know how tough it is to get parking, how expensive it is, how expensive all the concessions are. Uh, where here's something in your own backyard that, that uh, despite the controversy in the beginning, seems to uh, ultimately a, be a good idea. So you believe that Railcat Stadium is a good idea as it pertains to the citizenry of Gary and surrounding, as well as a good economic development move? Well, we talk about in economics the, the, the phenomenon of opportunity costs. You know, could a lot of other things have been done? Of course, of course. But once this is done, I think full participation is in everybody's interest right now. Yeah. Final comment on Northwest Indiana. Final comment on Railcat Stadium. What do you think? You going to some games, Matt? I'll, I'll go to a few games. And I think Northwest Indiana needs to get together. And I also think that the, the people who live in Northwest Indiana need to look long and hard at their elected officials and make sure they're choosing the ones that are, are thinking about uh, the future of Northwest Indiana and not dealing in the past. Wonderful, wonderful. The big Matt. picture. The big picture. Matt, thanks for being on the Matt, show. Appreciate we want to thank you all for joining us on The Big Picture. My co-host, Theo McLennan from, Teddy Mc, from McLennanReport.com and Matt Reardon from SEH. Email us at info at You all have a wonderful evening.